So you remember OSPF? OSPF is a routing protocol. It means that in the family of IGP, uh, Internet Gateway Protocol. So these protocols are internal protocol in your company. And so what you want to do is to have the simplest configuration. And with this simplest co uh, configuration, you want to collect all information regarding other routers that are in your company. So we, we saw that with OSPF, we have we can divide it in two areas. One area will be the backbone. And you connect over area to this backbone. So backbone is always area zero. And then you can have here area one, area two, etc. So then, on this area, you will run the routing protocol. And the routing protocol is not something that is completely designed just for routing. But the main goal of the routing protocol is to collect information on synchronized database. It means that we saw that we have a flooding mechanism. And this way, we can create a database on each router and this database will contain a topological information about the area. So this, this router here, so this router is at the boundary between area 1 and area 0, will have a topological view of area 1. So this router knows about all the prefixes in the area. Then it will build another database which is summaries. Summaries means that you do just take all the prefixes here and you associate a code. If you are doing aggregation, and it's a good thing to do aggregation, because via this way you don't know all the, all the prefixes in details, but you take a shorter prefix that covers all the prefixes that you have in your area, then, of course, if you do aggregation, the cost will be a little bit different. But here you have your summary, and then you inject this summary here. Here, if I can do the same thing here, here you have a topological database for this backbone. So I will put this in a summary database, and I will inject it here. Same thing here, etc. So this way, you know perfectly what you have inside your area, and you just have an idea about prefixes that are outside of your area. So this is the way OSPF works. So we saw in more detail last week, and normally you will have soon the video. If so if you want to see it again and again, you can play uh, the video forever. And uh, so we saw how it works. We saw also the flooding mechanism. And now, today, we are going to see uh, an example that comes from uh, a Cisco example. It's when you have an area here, so your domain. So this is your company domain. And you have three, uh, for example, three place, places in your company, three subsidiary, and they have each of them as a network, and you interconnect all these subsidiary using links. Okay? And at the beginning, on this example, you have uh, you are running RIP on this domain. So what does it mean here? If you look in more detail to this zone here where you have router A, you see that inside you have two prefixes. One is 130.10.9.0.24. And the other one is 130.10.8.0.24. OK? So 
We are just looking here at the configuration of router A. So router A is here, you see, you have to configure its interfaces. So you see that interface, interface serial zero here will get, we will have this IP address 130.10.62.1. Okay, and the prefix is here 255, 255, 255.0 is the equivalent to a slash 24. Okay, so I give this interface address. So from the interface address, you can find the prefix associated to that link. Same thing for serial one, and same thing for Ethernet one and Ethernet zero. So this way, I have done the mandatory part of the router configuration. It means assign, assign addresses to interfaces. And then, I have to learn all the other configurations. I have to learn all the other prefixes from routers. So I could have done it manually. So I would have write IP root on the address, the prefix, sorry, the prefix on the router that can send the information. And I will have to do it for all the other uh, prefix that exist in the other areas. The problem is that it's very boring to write all these things. I can create mistakes. And for example, if something new arrives in the area or connected to router C, then I have to change the configuration in router A. So if I'm running a routing protocol, I just type these two magic lines. Let's say that I'm starting a routing protocol called RIP. And all the prefixes, all the interfaces that have an address that is in this class B, then we'll run RIP. So here I talk about class B. Normally I should never talk about classes because classes have disappeared between, uh, after 1993. But here, it was a very old command. It's, it's, in fact, here it's v1. And here, so I have still have the notion of classes. We'll see how we can play with that because on the Cisco router, it's, sometimes it's uh, more complex to, to manage this. So here, I just say that everything starting by 1, 130.10 uh, will be running RIP on its interface. So every interface is here start with 130.10. So I start RIP on all the interfaces. So this way, all the interfaces will send RIP messages and will listen to RIP messages. So now, I have a prefix here. This prefix will be learned by router C, and router C will send RIP announcement on the interfaces. So for example, if the link, so the, for example, if there is a prefix here, on the area from router C, of course I will take the shortest path to go from A to C. But if this link fails, then I will no receive any more announcement from router C. I will continue to re receive these announcements through B, but with a higher cost. And so I will go. I will send my traffic to C through B. So this way, my routing protocol allow me to configure automatically my routing table, my fib. And we will have also in case of failure, a new path to go from one di uh, direction to another. So, that was what you have done a long time ago using uh, RIP because that was the state of the art. But after this class, you know that RIP is no more the state of the art. And you want to move your network from RIP to OSPF. So you cannot do it in one day because you have to go to your, uh, for example, to change parameter in, your, uh, in this part of the network. So you want to do it in two phases. First phase is to change the backbone. 
So the interconnection between all, uh, all the router and put OSPF in the middle and continue to run RIP inside all your company network, subsidiary network. And then when you will have run OSPF in the middle, then you will put OSPF in, inside the over network. So we are going to, to see these two phases. So first phase is to put OSPF in the middle. So of course, here, we have a backbone. Or in fact, we have only one OSPF area. Uh, this OSPF area must be the backbone and will be uh, area zero. So here, I continue to have the same interface definition as before. So this interface, 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 this four thing here. I will not put here just to have spaces. And then I will send, I will start two routing protocol process. One will be to start router RIP. It means that I will start RIP, uh, RIP instance running on my router. And here I start router OSPF 109. And here it means that I'm starting OSPF also on my router. So I will have two routing protocol that runs that run in my, my uh, router. Okay, so 109 is just because I may have a lot of different and separated OSPF, OSPF process that run, and so I give a number just to differentiate them. But here in this example, we will just use one OSPF uh, instance. So now, what I have to do? First, I have to avoid to send trip messages here in my area zero. Because now I want, now I want to have OSPF. So it's very difficult to do with uh, RIP because you see that we have only one command here and this command is uh, not so precise because I, ca I just can say that all the root, all the interface belonging to this class, so 100, uh, 130 and 10, will run RIP. So in fact, it means the four interfaces. So what I will do here is to stop RIP on the two interfaces in the middle by telling that these two serial interfaces, serial 1 and serial 2, will be passive interfaces. So what is a passive interface? It's an interface that can receive RIP messages but will not uh, send messages. So if we put all our interface passive, then we will have no problem because uh, we will have no more RIP messages in the middle. Nevertheless, if we don't do that, we have, a, in fact, a precedence, a precedence between all your interfaces. What does it mean? It means that if you receive through OSPF information concerning alpha, the prefix alpha, and you receive from RIP the same information concerning alpha, then you will say that OSPF is better than RIP. So you will believe what OSPF says, and you will not take into account what RIP says. So it's very important because here, for example, with alpha, I will have a next stop, and with, uh, sorry, with OSPF, I will have a next stop, and with RIP, I will have another next stop. So it means that with the precedence, I will take this one. And if, for example, OSPF doesn't announce me this prefix, then I will go back to RIP. So I can give some kind of priority between routing protocols. So normally, OSPF since OSPF has a better view as a network than RIP, you will believe OSPF and you will not believe RIP. So it means that here, if I was continuing to send RIP messages inside my area, C 
since OSPF is better, then I will not take into account trip message. But imagine that here, so we suppress read messages inside the area, and we continue, of course, to run RIP inside the, uh, the red zone. So, I've done that. Now, for SPF on the router, I have to say the same thing. So here, what I will say, you see that here I have something more precise, because I can say that in network 130.10.62.0, and here I have a strange net mask. Here it's the opposite of the net mask we know because here we have 0, 0, 0, and then 255. So it's the inverse of the net mask. When you have 0, it cannot move. And when you have 1, it can move. So any interface that is starting with 130.10.62, and then we have a number will be in area 0. And same thing for this value. It will be in area uh, 0. So here you have two entries, but you can also collapse these two entries into one. Because here I am writing 62, so it's a binary value for 62, and here I have 0. And here I have another binary value, the same binary value, on 1 for 63. So now, they, now I have 0 .0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.255, 0 .0 .0 .0 .0.0.255, and 0 .0 .0 .0.255, well, what can I say? I can say that it's this part, and this bit can vary also. So I will write 0 .0 0.0.1. So one say that this bit can vary, that 255. And this way, I can have only one network entry instead of two network entries. But that just if you are very lazy by writing configurations. So this way, what I have said, I have said that these two serial interfaces belong to area zero. And I say nothing about all of the other interfaces, so we don't have OSPF on them. But here, in my router, what do I do? What I have done? I have done, I have a routing process with RIP. RIP will create his routing database. So RIP, routing information base. And from this routing information base, I will put information on my field. I have another routing process, so it's RIP. Here it's OSPF. OSPF will have its own routing info information base, which is totally different from the one with RIP. Here is just something very simple. Here it's all the databases we have seen. And then I will create my field. But this is an independent process. It means that things I have learned with RIP are unknown from OSPF and vice versa. So now, what I have to do is to tell this two routing protocol to exchange information and so to, to share what they have learned. So there is Something very simple to do, it's here, on RIP. What do I do? I say that every prefixes I have learned on OSPF 109 that are internal or external, then all these things I will redistribute it into RIP. So here, when I learn prefixes beta, beta, gamma, etc. on OSPF, I inject this information on RIP. My RIP here for, uh, sorry, beta, gamma. I inject this on RIP. And RIP will redistribute it inside its area. And I will put a default metric of 10. So it starts at 10. 
So this is one possibility. Now I do the opposite. It means that what I have learned with FRIP, I will send it to SPF. So if I have a prefix alpha in my database here, then I will send it to SPF. OSPF will learn about alpha and will tell the other element, the other router running OSPF that there is a prefix alpha. So, it could be very simple to do that, but in fact, when you change from one routing protocol to another, it's always very complex. Because the only common power you have is the prefix. Prefix is something that varies between 0 and 32 bits if you are in IPv4 and 0 and 128 bits if you are in IPv4, in V6. But that's all. Then you see that the routing protocol adds some information to the prefix. And this information is totally different from one routing protocol to another. So in RIP, you just add a cost. In OSPF, you add a cost, but you have also some vision of the topology. And when you go to RIP, you lose this topological vision. So it means that here, I can have a trouble, because how I made the distinction between a prefix alpha, which is locally available on that uh, link, and beta and gamma that are learned from outside. There is no way to do it. So I'm totally blind. And maybe with RIP, I am losing vision of the topology. So maybe, so prefix beta is in the B area. And maybe there is a backdoor link that allow me to go to, to this prefix. I cannot tell you, because in RIP, I just have a cost, and I don't know where is this prefix. So the problem is that here, with OSPF, I am injecting prefix into the RIP area. So people are talking, and this prefix comes back to me using RIP. What can I say? Is it because I can get the prefix using RIP, or is it just because I inject it with OSPF and it comes back? So I, I have no way to make the distinction. So I have to configure my router, because no, I know the topology, and I know that this prefix that I will have learned by OSPF are not in my area, so I don't have to re-inject the prefix into the OSPF routing protocol. So it's what I do here by putting a distribution a distribute list it means that it's a filtering list, ACL, that will say that when I'm sending something out of RIP, I will filter this information. And here what I say, here you see that this value, I have value 11 for this distribution list. And if I look here at access list 11, it says that I am allowed to send outside prefixes that I have assigned to that yeah, pink area. And everything else that I may have learned using OSPF, I will not send it to OSPF. So here I have to filter the information. So that's something uh, quite complex here, because I am in the worst case where I have two routing protocols, and this routing protocol does, does not behave the same. This transition period is not uh, so, so good. So next things to do is to put OSPF everywhere. So it's what I have done here. So here I have area 0. And here I want to continue to, I could have put area 0 everywhere. But we have seen that area 0 Everywhere means that we don't have a lot of stability. So what we prefer to do is to say that all these uh, subsidiary network will be an 
uh, area number, so area one, area two, area three, etc. So here you see that the OSPF configuration is much more easier because it's only four lines of configuration. So what I have to say, I have to, and we saw before that we can collapse the two first lines because here I say that these interfaces belong to area zero and I say that all the other interfaces here belongs to area one. So I just have here to configure to say this leg of the router will be in this area, this other leg will be in another area. And then I have finished. If I just do that, my protocol works. What I forced to do here is that in area, I say that things in area one can be uh, aggregated. It means that instead of giving the list of slash 24 I have here, it says here that I can aggregate and send something smaller, a prefix smaller that will regroup all the prefixes inside my area. It means that if I have nothing, if I receive no router announcement here, I will send nothing. If I have one prefix available here, then I will, sign, so I will send this value instead of the value I have received. So this way I will be able to do aggregation and send only one entry outside of my network. Aggregation cannot be automatic. You, as a network manager, has to have to say at which level you want to aggregate. So you see that here we have for the configuration point of view is very simple. You just type two, if we do aggregation here, about the area zero, you type two lines that say this uh, uh, interface are in area one, these interfaces are, are in area, z area zero, and I start OSPF. And you can go to vacation, it works. Now, if you look at what you will see inside the network, when you make a TCP dump or you use Wireshark to see your traffic, then you will have a lot of different protocols that will run, allow to discover all the other routers, then database exchange, etc., etc. So you will start complex protocol, but from the configuration point of view, it's quite easy and very simple for you to manage the, the routing process. So all the job is done by the router. So that's something uh, quite nice. Okay? So do you have question on OSPF? No? Very clear? So we will do an exercise uh, just after IS to IS. And so uh, we will see it's, uh, if you have questions. Trouble. Okay, so as I say, so I'm talking normally when I will talk about a routing protocol inside uh, a network, I will never say OSPF or IS to IS. For one reason, is that it's almost as dangerous to ask people, what do you prefer, Mac or Windows? And so I can ask you, uh, today, not so, not so good, but as uh, last week, but what do you prefer, Mac or Windows? Which system is the best? So, you, we have the same problem with routing protocols. In fact, historically, there was not OSPF. If we come back in uh, the 80s, we had one protocol called IP, Internet Protocol. What? But one, it was something quite new used by universities and research centers to learn about datagrams. And so they developed their own format and they tried to, to run a network on it. But nobody 
was able to tell that only IP will rule the world as we have right now. It was just one protocol among, among others. And at this time, you have also ISO, which developed some protocol. And one protocol is called CLN and P. So if you are a student in, uh, at start w w working in uh, computer science, you can be afraid because you have a lot of acronyms in, uh, in this field. And especially ISO is creating a lot of acronyms. But don't be of, of course, when you know nothing, it's very impressive to see all these acronyms. But in fact, ISO create acronyms because they don't want to, that a name match to a particular technology. They want to be as generic as possible. So for example, if you have a fork, so you use to, to eat, what ISO will do is to say that the fork, you make a description of the fork, and you say that, for example, is a tool to grab food. So you, get, you give definition and fork, and then you create your acronym T, T, G, F. And then you use it instead of fork in your language. So this way you are more generic than the fork, because you can imagine any kind of fork with uh, different form, etc., etc. And we have the same thing with, uh, with network. So, what is, what does IP? It's datagram. What is a datagram? Can you give a definition of datagram? Is it connection oriented? No. It's connectionless. And at which level, OSI level, is running IP? Network. Okay, so we are at the network level. And IP is a protocol. OK? So what do you have here? It's a description of what we are doing, connectionless network protocol. And it gives the name of the datagram. But we don't say datagram. We say cell and P. So cell and P is one that we spend of time one competitor with IP. And so, what do we add at this time? We add a network, and you have serious people like uh, CETA, for example, aviation, uh, that make uh, all the uh, airplane and airport exchange information, that will use Serious protocol like CLNP, and so the provider will have to make interconnection between CLNP uh, side, and you have the strange people from university that were running IP. Since providers are also serious people, they say, I will run CLNP on my network. So this way, I will be able to interconnect my CLNP customers. But of course, I have some university that wants to, or military people that want to pay to have interconnection. So I will not lose this market, and I will also create interconnection for IP people. But I don't want to develop two uh, networks, two different networks. So I will use the same network to route IP protocol. 
So I will create routers that are dual stack, that will be able to forward 7NP protocol and forward IP protocol. But I would like to have only one routing protocol here that will be able to manage uh, both IP and 7NP. So that's why OSI developed a protocol called IS to IS. So what does it mean IS? Same thing. It's intermediary system. So it's a relay. It's not an end system. It's something you have in the middle. So what IP will call a router. But here we don't give a name. We like to have acronyms. So we call it intermediary system. And what, is, what does it mean IS to IS? It means that it's a protocol between two intermediary systems, so between two routers. So it's what the definition we gave about a routing protocol. So CNP was IS to IS was using CNP transport, but was able to carry information regarding IP, CNP, etc. Nowadays, what do we have? We continue to have IS to IS inside some. Uh, routing uh, some uh, area, some uh, domains, but just to forward IP packets. And if you look at the division of the world, normally ISP prefers to run IS to IS. And uh, even if they don't have CNP customer, just to carry IP traffic. And if you are in a big company, Normally, you will run OSPF network. Of course, this division of the world is totally artificial because uh, you can find some provider that are using OSPF and some company that will run IS to IS. But it means that at the beginning, if we continue the history, we had only IS to IS. And the problem of IS to IS is that it's a protocol that was using uh, shorted path first, using the Dijkstra algorithm. So everything I showed you uh, before last week worked. But it was done by OSI, uh, IS, ISO, sorry, ISO. And it was some, in some way closed because you have to be a provider to access to this specification of the protocol. And so I, OS, IETF say, OK, since IS to IS is not open to everybody, we are, we are going to develop an open protocol. And this open protocol will be based on the same algorithm than IS to IS. It means shorted past first. And you have the name of the routing protocol we have seen, OSPF. OK? So they try to improve IS to IS by adding some feature we don't have in a, uh, they try to add, sorry, to OSPF feature we don't have to IS in IS to IS. But it's almost the same. And of course, since CNP disappear, then IS to IS become a protocol also managed by the uh, IETF. So now if you look at uh, IETF web pages, you will see some working group that work on IS to IS. So the question is, if I say, for example, in your network you have IS to IS, of course, half of the population will say, no, I prefer OSPF. It's better. So that's why we prefer to take the name internal gateway protocol. 
Because when I say IGP, I don't say that it's IS to IS, always tick. So I forget the war. I avoid the war between these two routing protocols. So, now, I told you that it's the same. In fact, it's not, it is not always uh, exactly the same. For one reason, it's that we don't play with addresses the same way in IP and with IS to IS or in OSI network. So here, for example, it's what I do with IP. I give addresses to interfaces. So we saw that in the example. When you configure a router, let's say this router here in the middle, you have to say these interfaces will be on area zero, the backbone, and these interfaces, the green one, will be on area one, and here I have created my area. So I divide, I give addresses to interface, and then I assign an interface to an area. But this is not very nice because it's a strange way to give addresses to interfaces. Normally, I have an ID, at each level I am, I have a different ID. For example, when I am at layer two, of course, here I have a line link and I have a MAC address. But normally at layer three, only my computer should have an address, not have plenty of addresses. And so that's something quite strange if you think about it, to allocate address to interface, even if it works well. It will create some problems. We, are, we have already talked about multi-homing. Here a system, I can, if I use well, this address to go to the system, then I will have one, uh, one address. If I use another way, I will use another address. So it's sometimes complex, but most of the time it, it works well. In IS to IS, or in OSI way to alloc allocate things, I don't allocate address to interface. I allocate address to equipment, to uh, this device. So here, for example, I will have address for this uh, router, address for this router, etc. So that's the first problem. It's addressing is different. Second problem is that if I am running an IS to IS network right now, or protocol right now, I don't want to bother about addresses because I don't want to go to another institute or another registry to get OSI addresses. I want to use it uh, without any problem. So we are going to see how we can structure this, uh, this kind of address. So, what we will do in IS to IS, in fact, is to give an address, and in this address, we will have an area number. And if we are in the same area, so if these two equipment have the same area number in the address, we will say that we have a layer one communication. So here you see I have layer one communication between the blue equipment because they will share the same number in, in this address, which is the area number. And I will have a layer one communication here because the red and the green share the same area number. And then the rest of the, communica uh, the co possible communication will be between equipment, piece of equipment that will not share the same area number. And this piece of equipment, or well, this connection, will be called layer two communication. And so what I will do, so here I have area that are with the same area number, and the rest will be the backbone. So the constraint is that this layer two here has to be continuous. It means that 
I cannot, in the bottom here, have a link between the red and the green because it will not be a continuous network. So this way, I will be able to, to create a backbone. You see that the backbone here is for links. It's not for read routers. But if you uh, look, it's almost the same. So that's the theory. So normally you can have layer one communication that you will learn things about the topology of your network. And then you can send here aggregation of what you have learned to just uh, have some abstract, some summary of what you have here to populate information regarding your layer two. So the same thing as what we have done in OSPF. So that theory, in practice, providers are only running layer two uh, networks. So they don't care about this and they all only exchange information using uh, layer two links. So, just to see another kind of address, because we talk a lot about IP addressing, but we can see other things than IP. And here is the way OSI, uh, ISO, sorry, allocate addresses. So, ISO, has to be universal. IP doesn't care of the rest of the world because IP is a stronger, so everybody has to go to IP. There is no question of diversity. It's IP and only IP. ISO is more universal. So you will have a first path here called FIP, Address Family Identifier, that will tell you which addressing plan you are using. For example, are you using an addressing plan that comes from your telephony company? So if you are using addressing plan coming from your uh, telephony company, then you can put in the IDI part, so in the initial domain identifier, a phone number. If you are using an addressing plan coming from IEEE, then you can put here a MAC address. So it means that you will have a diversity of addressing, a way of creating addresses, and in the AFI, we will, you will use a number that say, okay, this is a phone number, this is, uh, for example, uh, uh, X25 network or a mobile phone network, and you have a specific value for that. So you can have different addressing plans. In IP, we don't have this diversity. We just have something that comes from INA, and that's all. Then, you have this I IDI, Internet uh, Initial Domain Identifier, that is given by uh, an authority that runs the network. For example, your phone number is given by your phone company. And then in blue, you have the domain-specific part, it means that you can continue the address by creating internal addressing plan. So you receive what we will call in IP a prefix, and then you can do what you want after that. So you can also have some network on equipment on that subnetwork. So you see that the main criticism we can put on that is that we don't know the length on this. It can be very short, it can be long. So we don't have the fixed size we have in Internet. And we saw in the first class that the fixed size was a very easy way to manage datagrams. Because we know where is the address and we don't spend a lot of time to take the address. So that's why IP was technically better because you get the address very quickly. Here it's a little bit more complex because you have variable length addresses. So if we look uh, for our isa 2 is network, so we have the gray part here that is given by an authority. And then what you can do, you, is to use the blue part to number your routers. 
So here you can create an area. So you will put an area number. And then you will put here an ID for your router. And then what we will put in IP at the layer 4, it's a port number. Here we will put a value 0, which will, be, uh, which will give you the layer 4 application. For example, if you put 0 here, it means that you are here, it's a routing protocol. So to go to VIS, to IS process. Now, area ID, you can put 1, 2, 3. You, so you divide your network in areas and you put a number to areas. So that's quite easy. But each router must, uh, must have an ID. So you can also put a random number. You can put a lot of things. But when you manage a router in your IP network, you have to give 7NP address, or this kind of address, to this router. And you don't want to play with a lot of addresses, because otherwise it's very complex to do it. So one solution is, for example, you have an IP address allocated to that equipment. So would you write it that way? And then you write it at the OSI way. It means that you take four letters, 1921 dot four letters, 0811, then four letters, 9134. And this way, you can fill your ID part. So now, so that's it. it is a blue part where you can do what you want. But you can ask me, OK, that's good. But now we have to go to an authority and ask for a prefix of this IFI and IDI. So how can I do that? I don't want to go to my foreign company to get another prefix. So don't worry, there is a private value. And you put 49 here. And by putting 49, this is a private value. You don't have to put IDI. So this way, it's very easy to build by yourself your CLNP address, 49. Then you put your area number, an ID that is normally based on IPv4, and zero here to say that it's a routing protocol. So for example, here, as I say, I, am, I have my interface here, so I configure it as an uh, interface. So I give it its IP address. I say that I will run IS to IS. On, on IS to IS here, I put the, ID, I, the, I put the address. And the address will be 49, 1 because it's the area. And then an ID here that is based on the IP address of my router but it's just a unique number. But this way, I, I can match easily both value and a zero to say that it's a routing protocol. So you see that we are doing things in the other way. We are putting the address in the routing protocol because the address is unique for the system. But then we say to the interface that on this interface, we are running the routing protocol. For SPF, it was the opposite. We were in the routing protocol. We were saying which interface was using it. So if, since we inverse things in OSI, we have to inverse it in the configuration. So why IS to IS is also a good protocol? Is then when we wanted to move to IPv6, there was nothing to do, or almost nothing to do. Because IS to IS was not running on IP. So you have CNP, which was the transport protocol. And then you are transporting things. So you have IP information. You have CNP information. And then when you, if you want to run IPv6, we just create a new structure to carry IPv6 packets. Or to, oh sorry, to carry IPv6 prefixes. And so you do that, and you can root IPv6. So if you look at the specification of IPv6 for IS to IS, they are only in two pages. Because they say you use this uh, structure. It's what we call 
a TLV. Have you heard about TLV? You know what it means? So TLV means type, length, value. So it's a structure where you have first a type. So it's a value that is standardized. And then you have a value that gives you a length, sorry, that gives you, it depends on the structure, either the length of all, st all the information or just the length of the value part. But it's almost the same. It means that when you receive this, you look at the type. If you know the type, then you can process the value. If you don't know the type, because you are a old router that runs only IPv4. You never heard about IPv6. You receive a type for IPv6. You don't know what it is. So you know the length. So you know how to skip it and go to the next TLV. So the use, what is good with TLV is that you don't have to know all the TLV, possible TLV, and you can skip it if it's not important. So it's something similar to what we have seen uh, with extension in IPv6, where in extension in IPv6 you have next header, so it's not the T but the next T, value, a length, sorry, and value. So UT will be in the previous either, and your t will point here, and then you know how to process it or not, and then you go to the next one, etc., etc. So that's the advantage of this structure, is that you don't know one, you can skip it. In IPv6, in fact, you have some bits here that say, if you don't know it, know it, then you can skip it. If you don't know it, you can core dump, because it's a very important thing, and every router has to know it. If you don't know it, uh, it's a shame, so uh, you have to be reconfigured. Or you can skip it and send an error message. So you have some bit in the type that give you these, uh, these different behaviors. But you will find this kind of structure everywhere, because it helps you to have a lot of flexibility in uh, designing protocols. So, that's uh, for IS to IS. So, I propose you to stop the class right now. <laughs>